your investment return projections are wrong. I know that for a fact. I guarantee it. My investment return projections are wrong as well. I'm going to build you the case as to why that is. And once I build this case for you, you'll say, oh, I never thought about it like that. Uh, this is one of those times you're just sitting there thinking, man, all the ink that was spilled. And then you see this one simple argument and you're like, oh, it was all for naught. And I'm telling you, man, <laughs> a Nobel laureate, Robert Schiller at Yale from the cyclically adjusted, cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, CAPE, uh, made this mistake as well. And, uh, and thankfully, there's some good, bright investment gurus out there who can point the air of our ways and then you'll quickly say, yeah, I never thought about that. So uh, let's see what we got. All right, first we're going to start, and this can be a, uh, it was going to be somewhat of a, uh, I don't know how long this will be. What's up, dog? All right, hold on just a second. Pablo, you want to go out? All right, so anytime I talk Pablo, you know you got to paw the like button. Hit paw the like button. All right, so this article came across my feed on uh, July 20th by my man Michael Finke here, or Fink, I'm not sure, from, uh, he's a, I think he's at American College, he used to be at Texas Tech. Good guy, I like him. Uh, the remarkable, remarkable accuracy of CAPE, and that's a cyclically adjusted P.E. ratio that Schiller talks with Robert Schiller from Irrational Exuberance fame, Yale, and the Nobel Laureate. All right, so the, uh, uh, let's see, we're going to go down here and it says, in a period where uh, the CAPE right here, CAPE predicted 10-year S&P returns versus actual returns from 1995 to 2000. And you'll look at this like, whoa, that's right, man. Um, you can see. So the higher the CAPE was, the lower the returns. The CAPE is a cyclically adjusted P-E ratio. So instead of going like this, they adjusted over 10 years to kind of flatten it out. And it was essentially on the, side, on the high end where we are now, the lower next 10-year returns were, were low as this shows you. So look at all these different scenarios. Look at all that. That's all the 10 years. And you can see the higher the cape was, the lower the rates of return. The standard deviation of the error, how far off the prediction went for the actual value is 1.37. So here's the prediction. Here's the actual value. Uh, this is the difference between the predicted annual return, the yellow dot, and the actual return, the blue dot. Or excuse me. This is the uh, the actual return is the blue dot. And this is the uh, predicted. So it's, it's off a little bit, but not much. 1.37. Uh, in other words, 67% of the time, the return was 1% uh, percent from the CAPE model prediction, 1.37%. And 95% of the time is within 2.74 of the future 10-year predicted returns. Uh, CAPE, CAPE's ability to predict 10-year future returns during the last 25 years has been remarkable. As I write this, the S&P 500 CAPE is 29 the 10-year return we can expect using the 1995 to 2020 model is 5.89, with a 67% it will be between 4.5 and 7.26. This is about 1% year lower than BlackRock's 10-year market capital expectations for U.S. stocks, but still in the ballpark. Over the next 10 years, a hypothetical equity return of 10% is exactly three standard deviations above what the CAPE would predict. Uh, and it basically, if returns are normally distributed, a 10% S&P return has about a 0.3% chance of occurring, or 99.7% not chancing. All right, well, is, uh, was a 1995 to 2020 period different than historical? It's not. Since 1975, the Schiller Cape has explained 85% of the vari variation in future stock returns. In fact, the CAPE's ability to predict 10-year returns was remarkably strong until just before the Great Depression. All right, so he talks about that. Uh, so we're going to stop that for a second. So I want to show you this other article, which is um, uh, <laughs> which can blow the lid off this. All right, so basically what my man Finky's saying, Robert Schiller from Yale are saying, is that CAPE can predict returns with incredible accuracy. And so if CAPE is trading at uh, 29, the S&P 500 is the CAPE ratio, cyclically adjusted P.E., you basically aren't going to get much more than 5 to 6% rate of return going forward. All right, well, let's blow the lid off that. Uh, I had never thought about it like this. Um, I, I had an intuition, but I'd never, it never occurred to me until I read my man, uh, Thomas C. Thomas Howard, and I'm not even familiar with him, so I had a, who is this guy? And I look, I follow this stuff. I don't even know who this guy is. Uh, Emeritus Professor of Finance at the University of Denver and CEO and Chief Investment Officer of Athena Invest. So let's see what uh, the professor says here. CAPE is a very noisy market predictor. 
Analysts have many ways to estimate expected market returns. The challenge is to identify those that provide usable information for making investment decisions. In this article, I discuss one of the common mistakes made in this type of analysis and why the cyclically adjusted P.E. ratio developed by Schiller is not nearly as reliable a predictor as most people claim to be. Um, is widely accepted as an in, 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 indicator, an indicator of market over and under valuation is no doubt due to its fundamental intuitive appeal. As an example many, of its wide acceptance, many market commentators are warning that the market is overvalued and thus are forecasting low returns. However, check this out, for any such measure to be useful for making investment decisions, we first need to determine if it has a reliable predictor of future market returns. As an example of this type of testing, a recent Advisor Perspectives article, the one I just read, read to you, uh, found that the CAPE was remarkably accurate. This anointed CAPE as an excellent candidate for making portfolio decisions. Unfortunately, the author made the mistake of regressing 10-year overlapping returns on monthly values of CAPE to reach this conclusion. The misuse of overlapping returns is such a common and critical error that it is worth looking more closely at why it is mistakenly used so often. I will discuss how you correctly use CAPE in making decisions. Since daily, monthly, or even yearly market returns are noisy, it is a challenge to uncover statistically and economically significant relationships that can help in decision making. I'm going to stay with me. I'm going to stay with me. I'm going to go into this deeper to show you exactly. I read this like, I don't, that makes sense. I'll show you another article from these other guys, and you'll be like, oh, I get it now. Uh, all right, so basically, this is particularly the case when trying to forecast the long-term returns. Uh, the short time period from 1995 through 2000 was the focus of that article. I think it was 2000. I don't think it was 2000. I think it was 2010, wasn't it? 1995 through, what was it? Uh 2020. So there's a typo. There's 1995 for 2020. Um, the short time period from 1995 through uh, 2020 was that there were only two 10-year overlapping, non-overlapping periods. Two. Two. That's it. So all these data points are overlapping except for two. So my man Finke and Schiller and all these guys, they look at this. They look at all these data points. Only two are not overlapping. And stick with me. I'll tell you what that means here in just a second. So from 1995 to 2020, we only have two data points of non-overlapping observations. All right, two data points is insufficient for a statistically significant test. A widely used solution to this problem is to calculate overlapping or rolling 10-year periods, which increases the number of observations from, 10, from 2 to 180 in this sample. At first blush, this is a huge increase in statistical power. So we're basically saying we're going to go March uh, 1995 to uh, February 2020, April 1995 to March 2020, so on, so on. But this improvement in increase in statistical power is a mirage. The problem is that no new information has been added since adjacent 10-year returns have 119 out of 120 monthly returns in common. So if we take our trusty calculator, we get 119 divided by 120. We have a correlation of 99.1% because you have 120 months in that time frame, 119 are equal. Other than that one month time in these rolling 10 years, they're, they're all the same. They're not statistically different at all. <sighs> the result is that their statistical power as captured by the number of independent observations has not improved. The overlapping bias, which makes results look much stronger than they are, is well known and extensively documented in this paper. And we're going to click on this because I'm going to read that to you. Unfortunately, is mistake still frequently made by practitioners and academics? Even Schiller falls prey to this error. Again, this is the 10-year overlapping thing right there, as you can see. It looks like a lot of data points are just noise. The graph reveals a tight relationship between CAPE and market returns, something the article referred to as remarkable. The author further reported that CAPE explained astounding 90% of return variability with an average forecasting error of a mere 1.3%. These are indeed deep, impressive sounding results. But unfortunately, the powerful results are the largest the consequence of the misuse of overlapping returns. Instead, if non-overlapping returns, 10-year returns have been used as a statistically sound 
from 1926 to 1920, uh, you would have a graph like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You get nine sample sizes. That's it. That's it. From 1995 to 2020, you only got two. It's not enough. You get nine tests. And here you go. So the CAPE was up here at 26. Uh, the CAPE was over here at 20. Uh, five, the cape was over he here at uh, whatever that 21, and you can see the cape was over here at 11 and had returns of only uh, four and a half percent. Cape was over here at 26, had a higher return than that. So, in fact, in this case, you can see when the cape was higher than uh, in the when the cape was above 20, it looks like two of the three times that had a higher return than the cape was. At his, uh, was at his lowest. It's completely statistically irrelevant. Oh, man, it's crazy. The more closely, uh, the, this more closely portrays the true K per turn relationship, which is not as neat and tidy as the previous one. Now, less than half the return variability is explained by K, while the prediction error has quadrupled to 5%. Because you simply can't say there's any predictability in a high K and a low return or a low K and a high return. You could say here, that there's some semblance of low cape high return and here I mean, it does go down a little bit it means there is some <laughs> some evidence to say the lower the cape the higher the returns the higher the cape the lower the returns we only got nine sample sizes that's it an n of nine and two of these ends have a highest the cape and they have higher returns than uh than the lowest the cape there is crazy uh, let's see, uh, rather than the 10, or if we address the more interesting and practical question of forecasting the one year market return rather than the 10 year return, the forecasting error quadruples again in 19%. This clear, clearly shows that CAPE is not a very, is a very noisy predictor rather than the remarkable forecasting tool claimed by the author. Overlapping returns should be avoided when testing the accuracy of market return predictors. There are several corrections that can be adapted, and uh, they talk about them in these papers. So I want to go to this paper right here. All right, so where he, uh, yeah, right here. So I just got done reading this for your reading pleasure, and we're going to go into this. We're going to download. Oops, trying to open it, and I'm going to read you some of the highlights on this because it's it's incredibly important. Um, if I can open it up here. Open a PDF in the browser. There we go. All right, so just open in the browser. Oh man, I just ah. All right. Open. There we go. All right, sweet. All right, so this is uh. Oops. Oops. There we go. I'm just gonna go down to right here. Long-term return regressions have effectively small sample sizes. Using, I'll put a link in the show notes. Using overlapping long-term horizon provides only marginal benefit. Adjustments for overlapping lapping observations have greatly overstated T statistics. The evidence from regressions at multiple horizons is often misinterpreted. As a result, there's much less statistical evidence of long horizon return predictability than implied by existing research, casting doubt over claims about forecasts based on stock market valuations and factor timing. So he talks about right here. Uh, pronouncements in the media of how cheap or rich the stock market or aggregate factor portfolios have become are quite common. These views all, often creep into practitioner academic financial literature. Evidence of bubbles have accelerated since the GFC, global financial crisis. Valuation of stock and bond markets have reached high levels. Uh, Cape, one over Cape cyclically adjusted PE stands at 26, higher than ever before, except for the times around 1929, 2000, 2007. All major market peaks. Long-term investors will be well advised individually to lower their exposure to the stock market when it's high. All other things being equal, and to get in the market when it's low. That's in 2015. Never mind how much you've missed since then, but still, empirical support from these types of statements originates from seemingly impressive evidence of long-term, long horizon predictability of stock returns based on valuation measures. Further, practitioners often document strong le levels of statistical significance using overlapping long horizon returns based on standard errors that they believe they correct for overlapping data. Here's Bill Reichenstein uh, from Baylor. Get uh, Rob or not? I'm sure that's Peter Bernstein. Uh, just I mean, some of the biggest Siegel. Ugh. I mean, some of the biggest names in this business. 
The issue here is there are few independent long horizon periods in the short samples used to study markets. Using overlaying data uh, in terms of increasing the sample size offers little help. Intuitively, no matter how the data is broken down, you can't get around the short sample sizes. So let's, uh, uh, we show, th uh, let's see, for example, in forecasting five year stock returns using 50 years of data, the effective number of op observations from non overlaying overlapping is only 10. But if you do it on a monthly basis, you have 600. Increases, uh, which doesn't change anything, it doesn't. So for example, the five year stock return horizon with 50 years of data, the range of possible standard error estimates is so wide to make inference, inference nonsensical with the expected T statistics double their true value. Applying the appropriate statistics to data on long horizon stock returns and evaluation ratios drastically reduces the significant sig statistical significance. All right, so I wanna show you something here. Um, let me see if I can't find it, let me pause it real quick. Yeah, so here's the CAPE and here's the non-correlated. So we got non-correlated, this is before 2020. So I think this was written in uh, 2017, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have five year returns for uh, Cape 1968, we got eight. But if we go to uh, five year returns on a monthly basis, we have a hell of a lot more. And it looks a lot more noisy. Look at that, the swarm effect. Look at that swarm. But look at that, that's just, you can't, there's, you can't make any kind of, there's no sense there in five year returns. Uh, Ten-year returns, we got uh, going back to 1883. That's just, there's nothing you can make here. You can't make any prediction on that. But if you go where you're doing it monthly, monthly, where you're overlapping data, it's a swarm effect. So in an attempt to combat this issue of a small sample size, practitioners will often sample long horizon stock returns more frequently using overlapping observations, believing they are increasing their sample sizes significantly. Uh, for example, in referring to the CAPE's ability to forecast 10 years return relative to his previous work, Schiller, Schiller writes in uh, the latest edition of Irrational Exuberance, we now have data from 17 more years, 1987 through 2003. And so 17 new points have been added to the 106 from 1883. Consistent with the overlapping scatter plots on the right-hand side of figure one, right here, are in stark contrast to the left-hand side of scatter one. A plot one right there. <sighs> All right, so right here, you ready? Um, uh, da, da, da. As such, in describing the estimated positive relationship between CAPE and future long term returns, Schiller writes the swarm of points in the scatter show a definitive tilt. The swarm of points in the scatter show a definitive tilt. Hmm. This is a fallacy, and Schiller's above sample. Example, because CAPE is measured as 10-year moving average earnings is highly persistent, only two, not 17, non-overlapping uh, non observations have, actually, have truly been added. To see this, note that standing in Ju January 2003 versus January 2004 and looking ahead 10 years, in both cases, the future 10-year returns have nine years in common. And it will be a 90% correlation by construction. Moreover, CAPE itself has barely, cha barely changed due to its 10-year moving average of earnings and fundamental persistence of stock prices during the period from January 2003 to 2004. It is these facts that create by construction Schiller's swarm effect, visible in the figures. But in reality, there's just a smattering of independent data points, 12 to be precise. How much, if anything, do overlapping observations really benefit the practitioner? And he goes in to say it doesn't benefit at all. You can have all this stuff. You still cannot get over the fact you have a small sample size. So we'll just go down to the conclusion here because, I mean, there's lots of good stuff. And I'll put that in the show notes. <coughs> Why standard error procedures for long-term return regressions are inaccurate. I'm not going to read that because I've already taken 19 minutes up here. But I'm going to just read you the conclusion here. I'm going to read you some places you can find uh, more information on this conclusion. By construction, long horizon return regressions have effectively small sample sizes. And as a remedy, practitioners perform these regressions use more frequent sampling of the long-term horizons. We show that the benefit to using overlapping observation is marginal because the predictive variable tends to be highly persistent. Uh, standard statistical packages that calculate t statistics based on adjustments for overlapping observations do not help in fact they tend to inflate the t statistics 
Researchers should be aware of these to avoid drawing in incorrect inferences. So I just did it real quick on my own. I said, let me, I took the S&P 500 and I went back to 1930 and I said, okay. So we go back to 1930, 1959, the average return is 12.18. 1931 to 1960, 12.9. Now remember, there are th there's 90, was it? We got 30. So we're rolling 30 year periods. We got 29 divided by 30. We got 96% correlation. It is not independently observational. It's just not. It's completely correlated, highly correlated. Uh, 1931 to 1960, uh, uh, or 1932 to 1960, 15.3. 15.225, 14, 14, 13. You see what I'm saying? So it, I, I'm telling you, and this is just based on the returns. It has nothing to do with PEs or anything. What I'm just trying to get you is look at the similarities between uh, the results. If you're using a 30-year rolling period, 29 of the same. It's just for the next year. It's not statistically independent. It's just not. And as such, you can't use it. You just can't. You can say we have nine or 10 different 30-year rolling periods, but that's it, man. What kind of information you get of that? Well, third, you know, if you have nine or ten, that's just not a sample size large enough to make any determination. Lastly, let's go over to Vanguard, and uh, so we can say, so what? The only thing you can do then, if you can't use five, I mean, I guess you could, but there's no, no there's just noise between five-year average rates of return, uh, thirty-year average rates of return. Uh, you can't, you just can't make your predictions on that. So what you could use, you could say, well, dividends. I uh, say dividends are paying two percent, so we could at least know where we should get a two percent dividend. But then you have no idea what the P will be relative to the E. Just don't. So I just used the uh, earnings, year-over-year -year earnings, uh, uh, expected year-over-year -year returns is, will be based on earnings growth year-over-year, e.g., uh, YOY, e.g., year-over-year plus dividend yield. That's it. That's all you can do. And then you got to do it again the next year and the next year and the next year. What are we expecting for earnings growth the following year? That's all you can do. You cannot make forecasts based on any significant. There's just no statistical evidence of that. Now you can say on any given one year, the average return has been 10.27 going back to 2017. This is from Vanguard, and they do the same thing every year. It's always the same thing. The annualized return is 10.27. That is the average on any given year. The average return is 10.27. Uh, you can see plus or minus two percentage points. Look at that. Uh, so returns fell uh, only six out of 92 years. Do they fall within 12.27 or 8.27 that's it it is all noise you cannot make any prediction on an annual basis whatsoever you can't you can't you can use earnings growth year over year plus dividend yield that's fine but look at this the average rate of return is 10.27 only six out of 92 times so six divided by 92 only six and a half percent of the time did you get it anywhere near eight between eight and 12 that's it Every other year is complete noise. So unless you held on for 30 years and you had from 1926, you only had what eight time frames, you have no clue what your return is gonna get. You none. And this is going back to 1926. To say this will be your return going forward, there is no statistical evidence of your predictions. Even freaking Nobel laureates get it wrong. Ah, man, it's crazy. So what do you do? I just, I would say, what do you think the earnings growth year over year is going to be? Five and a half, you got 2% dividend yield, say seven and a half. I'm very comfortable with that. Four and a half, and you got 2% dividend yield, you can say six and a half. And so for me, as I go back to value versus growth, I sit there and say value is underwhelming. Um, it's just underwhelmed for a long time. At some point, it's got to revert back to mean, right? Well, they're, they're, the noise would say no, because it, the evidence that says lower PE stocks, when you're using uh, rolling years as opposed to non-overlapping, says yes. But if you're, but that's that is not it's not statistically proven. That's just noise. If you're using non-overlapping, there's just no hardly any evidence at all. It's just none. And then you factor in this is just the United States. Hell, you look at Russia, China, you know Taiwan. You look at all these other countries out there. They're they're just you don't know what you're gonna get. So I would, I would highly suggest you stop the idea that you're going to get um, any kind of knowledgeable rates of return and that you say, I can put my portfolio away for, you know, at 6%, 8% and assume I'm going to get that each and every year because you just don't know. You got to run your plan every year. I know it's a long video, but man, even noble warriors get this wrong. All right, we'll see. I'd love to hear your thoughts. We'll see you.